implementation is on on-site analytical laboratories to monitor process stability and other transmission systems. Uh, Mr. Rodrigo, yeah, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, so this is a study that we did uh, in New York State uh, about installing some uh, on-site uh, laboratories to monitor um, analytic digestion processes. In fact, the idea was to just monitor the process, not the, the actual uh, whole system, CHP system. Because the what we found out this is, that is really important is that the process is kind of if the process fails everything else fails. So let's go ahead and with this. So uh, just a quick introduction uh, here, um, and probably we have seen this more uh, in other presentations. There's uh, the three states with the most uh, digesters in the United States are. Wisconsin, New York State, and Pennsylvania. This uh, according to numbers from the EPA of last year. Most of these digesters actually are, or most digesters now, nowadays are co-digesting with uh, different substrates. Most of them are food wastes that they find in the nearby areas. Uh, most of the times, actually, not so nearby. Sometimes there's 200 miles, I mean, 200 miles, or 50 miles, 100 miles. Or, so 200 miles sometimes. And they do this because they increase biogas yields, they increase the methane content, and you know, they receive tipping fees. Many times this is the driving force for the economical revenue of the feasibility of the, uh, of the project. So it's really important to call it just uh, for farms that are just out as a base, the manure. So the problem with the co-adjustment and, and, and our previous presenter was talking about that, that there's risks. And many times you don't really know what's going to happen when you have uh, a substrate. And the, the substrate vary over time, so it's really difficult to know ahead. Even if you run BMPs and uh, you have uh, analytic toxicity assess assays, or even if you do range scale digesters for long-term studies, one or two years, there's always something can change or there could be a contamination in the process, in the batch. Uh, and so that's a problem. So the best thing to do is try to monitor these digesters uh, continuously, or at least periodically. Um, these are just numbers from a study last year in 1998. Uh, and these are very bad numbers, actually, that uh, the failure rates for black flows and continually steel tank reactors was around 60 to 70 percent. And in 2013, uh, of course, probably these numbers are better because the engineering is better, the more co contractors are there, many more. Uh, but still, there are problems with uh, inadequate management, poor management, and, and there's not so much process of control unless the uh, contractors um, take care of the system too, not only they just sell the system, but they also they can operate it. Uh, so the consequences of this poor management is normally inconsistency in the CHP output, the underperformance, and sometimes short-term failure. And there's examples in Michigan, Ohio, and your state, many uh, of these uh, failures and digestive crashes. Uh, here we're going to focus on your state. Um, this study that we conducted uh, some time ago, uh, where we evaluated seven digesters uh, in New York, and we evaluated a bunch of several, um, several parameters, uh, but we're going to focus now here in online efficiency and capacity factor. Uh, these are really important uh, parameters because they will tell you how much power it was produced throughout this, uh, in this case it was like an entire year. and. Uh, so the line efficiency here for these digesters was really high and well pretty decent at least 88 percent that means that the uh, chp system was working 88 percent of the time in average for all these uh, farms and you will see the, the line efficiency is this uh, the bars the wider bars but the capacity factor is a different story. The capacity factor was 57% in 
in average. I mean, some of the farms are, uh, uns uh, digesters have a really low capacity factor, less than 20% in some cases. So what this is telling you is the capacity factor means that what, how much energy was produced throughout the year when it's um, normalized by the nominal capacity of the of the CHP system. So it means that if, even though you have 88% of the time the, the engines were running, only 50% of, uh, percent of the capacity was achieved. So that means that it's not the actual engine, but it's actually the biogas. The low production could be the could be uh, lower methane content, or sometimes just failure of the digester. And here are some of the reasons. But like I said, most of the reasons here were in the three first uh, factors: uh, decrease unstable biogas production, lower methane rates. Uh, or uh, ratios or downtime of the CHP system. And we know that too because this is the biogas production and the y axis for all five of these systems that I just uh, talked about. And you can see that the high variability of the biogas production uh, sometimes, for example, this that just here crashed for more than two weeks. So the problem here, and also the and a previous presenter uh, mentioned that too, uh, you know, pretty much all the digesters in the U.S. at least are operated by, by a farm worker who has no experience whatsoever in, uh, or training in, in, in doing uh, another digestion, not even pilot scale or range scale or anything. So they need some training. And, but the problem is that they are really are concerned about producing milk not really like operating there, just that that's kind of a, an extra, an additional uh, responsibility they have. So for example, if we take this um, 57 or 0.57 uh, capacity factor and the number of capacity of, of the whole U.S., which is uh, based on according to uh, numbers of the EPAs is almost 84,000 uh, kilowatts, of electrical capacity, only in the digesters that are operating, of course. Uh, and we assume uh, that all the digesters are well operated, so with a capacity factor of 0.9. And this translates in 660 gigawatts per hour of total energy produced in a year, or around 57,000 households uh, that can be powered by that uh, amount of energy, or 33 million. Uh, Annual revenue, uh, 33 million in annual revenues, or it could be three times more actually if you are in the norm, for example. So, but with the capacity the factor of 0.57 that I just mentioned, you, you get much less power and you or energy, and you can power many less uh, households. Not only that, but there's also impacts uh, with the tipping fees. You you wouldn't get tipping fees. And that would be a problem because ma in many farms, at least in your state, tipping fees are kind of the very force. Although that's kind of changing because there's much more competition for food waste now. But uh, that's a main factor. And the other problem is that if they have a contract, the, the farm has a contract with the, with the food uh, producers, uh, food waste uh, generators, then they have to, they're kind of obligated to receive the food waste and they have to put it somewhere. And normally they put it in an open lagoon and that will have obvious consequences in all our greenhouse gases emissions. So the problem, that, uh, the problem, the program that I was talking about is the, was funded by NYSERDA in New York State. And the goal was to train a uh, workforce of operators and technicians and implement uh, analytical labs on site in the in the farms and the idea was to try to improve the performance and try to detect the process upsets more efficiently and therefore to prevent system failure and we were looking at the key process parameters that will tell us when this is going to happen when there's going to be a problem and it's basically a cow or a digester is like a cow uh, the only difference normally is just the retention time of course but when the 
whereas the, the cow, uh, you want to maximize the, the production of milk and high quality milk. In the case of that, it just is the production of biogas and the high quality of the gas. And uh, so we, we sample uh, in these labs, analyze several uh, parameters. Pretty much all of them are here, but we learned throughout the process that total alkalinity and volatile fatty acids were the most important ones. But then we realized also that the ratio between the two, the VFA and alkalinity, were even more important. And it was an easier uh, test that we can actually conduct because the problem was that uh, the farmers they didn't want to spend so much time doing analysis, and and with that we get them to do uh, this analysis once a week. That was the, the best. Actually, mo normally they did it every two weeks. So I had to reduce the the time of the analysis, uh, and that was one way of doing the VFA to alkalinity ratio. And this is how kind of the the labs look like. And, and this is a case study. It's one of the farms that. Uh, had just started doing the, the analysis. We implemented the lab, and and this is uh, maybe you cannot see it on the x axis, but it's approximately one year of biogas production power output on top. <clears throat> and the biogas production is fairly, fairly constant. There's not really constant, but that's kind of what you would expect. In any case, this is a manual. Um, Almost manual only digest so they receive way every every week, but not so much. <clears throat> but uh, at this point, and we started the monitoring right there. I was right, just right before, and they had a crash. The biogas production went down, and of course, the CHP system also was shut down for a couple of weeks. Then ABC, it's well, not really a closer look, but uh, this is a course of maybe. Uh, Something like three months or something like that. But this is the same crash here that I just showed. The first graph is the biogas production. The second one, no, the, the first one is the, the power output of the CHP system. The second one is the biogas production. This is the pH. These are the volatile fatty acids. And this is uh, the volatile solids that we were sampling. And this was previous to. Um, when, uh, to the, the fact that when we started actually doing the VFA to alkalinity ratio. And this is also a black flow CSTR or complete mix uh, hybrid digester. So we were not sure where to actually sample the, the digester. And we actually, the only way that we can get away with that was to sample the, the effluent, which is not the most adequate. Uh, or, uh, yeah, the most appropriate uh, place to monitor a uh, black flow digester because uh, most of the actions where the acidogenesis and the hydrolysis occurs is kind of in the first stages of in the length um, of the digester. In a CSTR, uh, it doesn't matter; it could be in the effluent because it's the, that's the digested. And but still, we could actually see some anticipate a little bit of the crash, and we have only two sample. Uh, to the data points because we just started it. But if we had more data points, we probably could have seen that this race in the VFA uh, at this point, it would have been, and we would have been able to predict that the, the bypass production was going to go down. And this here. But uh, again, it's more difficult to do it in a black flow unless you have a sampling point that is really in the first stages of the digester. And as you see, it's much easier. And we realize about that. So this is just a figure that uh, we developed uh, where it's kind of a troubleshooting guide, maybe. But uh, how to identify problems, or how actually uh, uh, process upset occurs, or perturbation occurs. Uh, and this is basically a, the, the source of the problem could be operational parameters, a change of them, or, or, or a substrate uh, change. And then here, uh, when something happens, there's a perturbation. Uh, and this is the relative time. If no actions are, are taking uh, in, the, in place, 
or for example, if there's a problem with the loading frequency or the temperature changes, and you don't do anything to correct it, uh, you will just go from process perturbation to a register upset to eventually to a process failure. And there's several signals to that you will see throughout the process. And these are the signals that we would like to keep track of with the monitoring process. So our conclusions are that we saw that less than 60% of electrical potential uh, is can be based in like at least in our study of seven digesters was uh, due to poor AD performance and system failure. And normally it is the problem that uh, the operators are not really well prepared because they're farmers and it's not their job uh, to really run our digesters. But sometimes they don't have any choice. So we need to train them, and that's what uh, this uh, project was about, to try uh, to see if they can be trained. Uh, it was successful, and out of the five unfound uh, labs that were installed, um, only one, the one that I just mentioned, had a problem. The other ones are working really well. Uh, again, I mean, I, I wish they can actually sample more often, but at least we can get them to sample every, or do the analysis once a week. Uh, and because of that, they are actually working, the digesters are working fine, they, they have better performance, more uh, waste stabilization, and more stable biogas production. And we also learned that uh, you can, uh, the VFA, and actually I should have mentioned that before, but the VFA is a better indicator than pH, for example, uh, or biogas production, because VFA appears are the precursor of pH changes. So it's not just, you cannot just get the pH or measure the pH of the biogas production, or even the methane. Uh, quality, uh, the methane concentration and by gas, but you have to do something else, and the VFH or calinity ratio is a really good indicator. And I want to acknowledge the farmers and the, the New York State, uh, State Energy Research and Development Authority, my server. And thank you, and my contact is there. What was the VFA and ratio? Well, at that point, actually, I w we were not doing that, the VFA to alkalinity ratio. We were just doing the VFA. Uh, you, you didn't measure that? Uh, yeah, we were, uh, not at that point. We were just doing the VFA. And then in the, when we realized that alkalinity was really important too, and then we started doing <coughs> the VFA and the alkalinity so badly, uh, and then we changed to a VFA to alkalinity analysis that is actually, you get the two things. But the problem was that we were doing the uh, distillation uh, analysis for the VFA, so it took like one hour, two hours. So farmers were not really happy about that. So uh, once we convinced them to do it, then we changed to the, the, the other analysis, which was 15 minutes length, was much better. But I mean, I have some, uh, in the other, <coughs> in the in the digesters that we're monitoring now, uh, normally it's around 0 0.2 to 0 0.3, the ratio, kind of normal conditions. Uh, we have hit 0 0.4 and still it's good. Today, on that system crash, it's kind of interesting that we get spike so far after the crash. Did they figure out what caused well, yeah, that's the thing, <clears throat> and I was trying to explain that, that since it's a black flow, we were kind of monitoring kind of at, at the end, really. So with the CSTR, it's much easier because you get the kind of instant uh, conditions. But the black flow, we realized that we were kind of getting it a little bit delayed. So we have to sample probably <clears throat> the first feed of the digester or something. Like that. Power failed before the digester. Mm -hmm. 